ever heard that autistic folks are like too sensitive? Well, today we're looking at that idea, but from a whole different angle. Okay. We're going deep on something called reactive abuse and how it hits autistic people particularly hard. Right. We've got a whole bunch of articles on autism in general. Mm -hmm. But one that really caught our eye is all about how this specific type of abuse uh, shows up in the autistic community. Yeah, that's uh, it's really insidious how it plays out. So right off the bat, can you even tell us like what is reactive abuse? Because I think some people hearing that might think, well, isn't that just like someone being mean? Yeah, and it's not just being mean. It's way more calculated than that. Yeah. It's a tactic, huh. a manipulation tactic, and it's often used by narcissists. See, now there's another word narcissist that gets thrown around all the time. Right. I'm not always sure I get what it means in like real life, you know? Yeah, no, totally. Like what are we actually talking about here? It's almost like they have a playbook, you know, a narcissist's playbook. And the way they set it up is they provoke you. Hmm. They want to get a reaction out of you. Okay. And then they use that reaction against you. Ah, uh, so it's like it's, it's like, like a trap. Exactly, it's a trap. It's like poking a bear to make it angry. Right. And then being like, "Oh my God, look how aggressive that bear is!" Wow, I never thought about it that way. The goal is never to actually resolve whatever the issue is. Right. It's about power. Okay. And control. So, like, what are some concrete examples of how they do that? What's in this playbook? So many things. Yeah. Uh, passive aggression. Okay. Where they say things that sound nice on the surface, but they're actually dripping with sarcasm. Or they might straight up gaslight you. Ooh, yeah. Which is where they deny your reality and make you question your own sanity. Right, right. And it's all designed to make you feel like you're the unstable one. You're the one who's overreacting. While well, they're all calm, cool, and collected. Exactly. They get to be the reasonable one. God, that's so insidious. It is. So why are autistic individuals particularly susceptible to these kinds of manipulation tactics? Well, autistic people often have a really strong sense of empathy mm -hmm. and a tendency to trust others. Right. And those are good things. They're wonderful qualities. Mm. But a narcissist can twist those things around and use them against you. Right. So they're taking those good things and exploiting them. Exactly. Right. They exploit that inherent goodness to manipulate and control. And then you layer on top of that the whole issue of social cues, which we know can be tricky for a lot of autistic people. Absolutely. It seems like it would be hard to spot when someone's being manipulative if you're already struggling to read those subtle signals. It makes it so much harder to pick up on those signs. Yeah. Yeah. You're more likely to miss those red flags early on. It's like trying to navigate a maze in the dark, you know? Exactly. You're going to bump into some wall. <laughs> you're going to get lost. And here's the thing that I find extra concerning. We know a lot of autistic people deal with sensory overload, right? Yes. Anxiety or maybe even meltdowns. Mm -hmm. It seems like those experiences would make someone even more susceptible to the pressure of reactive abuse. Oh, absolutely. If you're already managing those challenges, right. you're more likely to react intensely to a narcissist's pokes and prods. And then that plays right into their hands. Exactly. It fuels their fire. They can point at your reaction as proof that you're the problem. Exactly. That's like a vicious cycle. It is a vicious cycle. They push you react. They use your reaction to justify their own behavior. Oh, man. Okay, so we're going to have to unpack this, but it sounds like there's a real danger of getting caught in this loop where the narcissist is constantly pushing your buttons, you're yeah. reacting, and then they're using that reaction mm -hmm. to basically say, see, I told you so. Exactly. And the more it happens, the more you might start to internalize those criticisms and actually doubt yourself. Oh, that's awful. <laughs> so let's make this really concrete for people listening. <laughs> okay. Can we pull some examples from the stuff we've been reading? Yeah, let's do it. To illustrate how this might look in a real situation. So yeah. what about, for example, an autistic person who's just trying to connect authentically with somebody? Right. Maybe by sharing some personal details. Yeah. And the other person uses that as a way to shut them down. Exactly. They might accuse them of oversharing yeah. as a way to control the conversation and make the autistic person feel like they've done something wrong. So it's not about genuine concern for boundaries. Yeah. It's about control. It's about control. Okay. What about those who struggle with what's called autistic inertia? Right. And I think we should define that term for folks who might not be familiar. Yeah. So that's that feeling of being stuck and unable to start a task which is a common experience for autistic people. Right. It's not laziness. It's not laziness. It's a neurological difference. It is. And a narcissist might use this to their advantage to label the person as lazy or unmotivated. Uh huh. And again, this just undermines their self-esteem and reinforces the abuser's power. And then their sensory sensitivities, right? So imagine an autistic person who needs clear communication 
or they get overwhelmed by loud noises, they're not trying to be difficult. Right, they're just trying to manage their sensory environment. Exactly. But a narcissist might twist that around and use it against them. Absolutely. They'll say, oh, you're so demanding or you're high maintenance. Right. And again, it's just a way to shift the blame and make the autistic person feel like they're the problem. So I feel like we've painted a pretty heavy picture here. We have. And if you're listening to this and thinking, wow, this sounds a lot like my life. Yeah. I just want to say, first of all, you're not alone. Yeah. What we're talking about here, this is real. Absolutely. And it's important to know that it's not your fault. This is not about you being flawed or defective. You are not too sensitive. It's about someone else using manipulation to gain control. Okay, so now that we've kind of laid that foundation of what this is, yeah, I'm really interested to dig into some practical strategies sure. for how to actually navigate these situations. Yeah. So what are some things people can do to start breaking free from this cycle? Let's get into it. One of the most empowering things you can do is really educate yourself about these tactics. Okay. About reactive abuse, mm -hmm. about narcissistic tendencies. Yeah. Because the more you understand that playbook, right. the better equipped you'll be to recognize those patterns and protect yourself. Knowledge is power. Right. It really is. But what about like in the moment? Yeah. Like you're in a heated argument and you can feel yourself getting triggered. Mm -hmm. What can you do right then and there to kind of de-escalate things? So there's this technique called gray rocking okay. that can be really helpful. What is that? It's basically about becoming emotionally unresponsive huh. to their attempts to provoke you. So you're not giving them what they want. Exactly. Oh, okay. So picture yourself as a gray rock. Okay. Solid, neutral, unmoving. I like it. Yeah. So how does that work in practice? Let's say you're getting hit with a bunch of insults. Or accusations. Right? Yeah. Instead of engaging with that, you respond with really short, neutral statements. Like, like, okay, or I see. Right. You keep your emotions in check, and you don't give them the reaction they're looking for. You're taking the wind out of their sails. Exactly. Like they're trying to get a rise out of you, and you're just like, nope, not playing. It can be so frustrating for them. I bet. Because they're not getting that fuel they need. That narcissistic fuel. Exactly. And eventually they might realize... Hey, my tactics aren't working here. Right. I'm going to move on. Now, gray rocking sounds great in theory, mm -hmm. but I imagine it's pretty hard to pull off if you're already feeling kind of overwhelmed. Yeah. So if gray rocking feels too tough in the moment, yeah. another option is just removing yourself from the situation. Just get out of there. Yeah. You're feeling overwhelmed or like you're going to lose control. Yeah. You can say, hey, I need a break. Mm and walk away. That makes sense. Sometimes you just got to disengage. Sometimes that's the best way to protect yourself. Yeah. But I imagine that can be hard too. Oh, absolutely. Especially if the narcissist is trying to make you feel guilty. Oh, they'll pull out all the stops. Like, don't you walk away from me. <laughs> How dare you abandon me. Oh, God, yeah. But you have every right to set boundaries and protect yourself. You don't owe anyone an explanation. Nope. You know what it's like that saying, not my circus, not my monkeys. I love that. Sometimes you just got to walk away from the drama. Yeah, just step away. So we've talked about dealing with things in the moment. Right. But what about the long-term effects of this? Yeah. Can this kind of abuse really have a lasting impact on your mental health? Oh, absolutely. In what ways? Prolonged exposure to this can lead to anxiety, depression, PTSD. Wow. Low self-esteem. It's trauma. It is a form of trauma. So it sounds like if you've been dealing with this for a while, yeah. you might actually need some professional help. You might. Therapy can be incredibly helpful okay. to process these experiences and start mm -hmm. to heal. And I think it's also important to remember the power of self-compassion. Right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Especially when you're dealing with the aftermath of abuse. Yeah, because it's easy to get caught in that blame cycle. You got to blame yourself. Like, what's wrong with me? Right. So can you talk a little bit more about what self-compassion looks like in this context? It's about treating yourself with the same kindness and understanding that you would offer a dear friend. Mm. It's recognizing that you're human. Yeah. You made choices based on what you knew at the time. Right. And you deserve forgiveness. You deserve love. Yeah. Forgiving yourself for not knowing better. Yes. For getting caught in that trap. Exactly. And I imagine that that self-compassion can help you build resilience too. It does. Yeah. When you practice that self-compassion, you're strengthening your inner foundation. Mm. You're less likely to be swayed by all that external criticism and manipulation. Because you've got that solid ground to stand on. Yes, because you have that deep well of self-love and acceptance to draw from. Mm. I love that image. 
a deep well of self-love. Yeah. It's like having this inner sanctuary yeah, it is. where you can retreat and recharge no matter what's going on out there. Exactly. But what about those times when self-compassion feels really hard? Yeah. What if you're struggling with those negative thoughts and feelings? Mindfulness can be a really powerful tool in those moments. Okay. It's like hitting the pause button on your thoughts. Mm -hmm. So instead of getting swept away by that negativity, okay. you just observe your feelings. So you're not judging them. Exactly. You're just noticing them as they come and go. So instead of being swept away by the tide, you're learning to surf. Yes. You're developing a sense of space around your thoughts and feelings. Okay. Which can create a lot of calm and clarity. Even in the midst of really difficult experiences. Exactly. This has been so helpful. Good. I'm glad. I feel like we've given folks a lot to think about. We have. And some really practical stuff to try. Absolutely. But before we wrap up this part of our deep dive, I want to touch on something we haven't fully explored yet. Okay. And that's the role of societal views of autism in all of this. Yeah. Because it seems like those stereotypes and misconceptions might actually make autistic people more susceptible to this in the first place. That's a really crucial piece of the puzzle. It is. Yeah, we need to consider how societal stereotypes and misconceptions might be making autistic people easier targets for this kind of abuse. Because if we're talking about breaking free from this cycle, right. we can't ignore the bigger context. Exactly. So much of how we perceive and treat each other is shaped by these societal norms and expectations. Yeah. And when it comes to autism, unfortunately, there's still a lot of misinformation out there. We've come a long way. We have. But there's still so much work to do. Absolutely. In terms of acceptance and inclusion. Yeah. And it feels like that lack of understanding can create a fertile ground for abuse to take root. It does. Think about some of the stereotypes we hear all the time. That autistic people lack social skills. Yeah. That they're too literal that they're obsessed with routines or that they can't understand emotions. Right, and those can be so damaging. They paint such a narrow and inaccurate picture. And they can be weaponized by abusers too. Absolutely, they'll say things like, you're just being too sensitive, that's just how autistic people are. Right. Or you're taking things too literally. Yeah. You're misinterpreting what I'm saying. So they're using those stereotypes to gaslight the person. They are, they're invalidating their experience. And they're using societal prejudice as a shield. Exactly. Like, I'm not the abuser. Society is. Oh, man. And that's why it's so important to challenge those stereotypes. Yes. And advocate for greater understanding. Because until we dismantle those harmful misconceptions, yeah. autistic people are going to continue to be vulnerable. Absolutely. We need to create a world where autistic people are seen and valued yes. for their unique strengths and perspectives. Not judged or dismissed because of these stereotypes. Exactly. So if someone's listening and thinking... I want to be part of that change. Yeah. I want to help create a more inclusive world. Where do they even begin? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. I think the first step is education. Okay. Educate yourself about autism from reputable sources. Yeah. There are some amazing books and articles and websites and podcasts out there. Absolutely. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Yeah. You know, if you're curious about something, reach out to autistic people. Right. Respectfully ask them to share their experiences. Learning from autistic people directly is one of the best ways to challenge your assumptions. Yeah. And just listen, you know, yeah. create that space where autistic people feel heard and validated. That can make all the difference. It can. When we truly listen to each other, that's how we break down barriers. Yeah. And create a more compassionate world. That's beautifully said. Yeah. Listening, learning challenging our own assumptions, advocating for change. Those are all powerful ways to make a difference. They are. And I think that's a perfect place to pause for now. When we come back, we're going to explore some more specific strategies for dealing with reactive abuse in the context of autism. Welcome back. So before the break, we were talking about how those stereotypes about autism can actually make autistic people more vulnerable to manipulation and abuse. Yeah, it's a really heavy but important thing to think about. It is. And it makes me think about self-advocacy. Yes. Like, how can autistic people learn to advocate for themselves in these situations, especially when they might be feeling overwhelmed already? Right. It's about learning to assert your needs and boundaries. Okay. Even when it's really hard. And finding your voice speaking up for yourself. Which I imagine is incredibly difficult. It can be. Especially if you've been kind of conditioned to doubt yourself or silence your own needs. Yeah. Where do you even begin with that? 
Well, I think a good place to start is identifying your triggers. Okay. What are the things that set off those really intense reactions for you? So it's about knowing yourself. It is. Understanding those buttons that get pushed exactly. and having a plan for how to handle it. Yes. Before it escalates. Before it escalates. Okay. So for example, yeah. like let's say, you know, that loud noises tend to overwhelm you. Right. You might carry noise canceling headphones with you. Okay. And just excuse yourself to a quieter space when things get too much. Okay. So you have a plan. You have a plan. That's really practical. Yeah. But what about actually communicating those needs to others? That's where clear and direct communication comes in. Okay. It's about learning to say, this is what I need or this is what I'm comfortable with and not apologizing for it. That's a good point. We often feel like we have to explain ourselves. Right. But sometimes it's enough to just state the need. Exactly. Clearly and confidently. Yes. But what if the other person doesn't respect that? Mm -hmm. What if they push back or try to make you feel guilty? That's when those self-advocacy muscles really get a workout. Okay. It's about standing your ground. Yeah. Reiterating your needs even when it feels uncomfortable. Which I imagine is super hard. It can be. Especially if you're used to people pleasing. Right. And sometimes it might mean walking away. Just getting out of the situation. Yeah, or even ending the relationship. That sounds incredibly difficult. I mean, it is. But also kind of empowering. It is. It's about putting your well-being first. Even if it means disappointing other people. Setting boundaries isn't selfish. Self-care. It is. Yeah. It's about protecting yourself so you can thrive. I love that. Mm. So we've talked about a lot of strategies for handling these situations. We have. But I'm wondering if you have any advice for... Those times when self-advocacy feels impossible. Yeah. You know, like if you're dealing with someone who's really manipulative and you just feel stuck. Yeah. In those situations, reaching out for support is so important. Who do you reach out to? A trusted friend, a family member, a therapist. Okay. Maybe a support group. Mm. Having someone to listen to you validate your experiences, offer guidance that can make all the difference. Support is so important. And you mentioned therapists. When would you say it's time to seek professional help? If you're dealing with chronic anxiety, depression, okay. difficulty sleeping, flashbacks, intrusive thoughts. Wow. Okay. So some serious stuff. Yeah. Those are all signs that it's time to reach out for professional support. Okay. A therapist can help you process those experiences and start to heal. We've talked about self-awareness, self-compassion, self-advocacy, seeking support. Mm -hmm. And I want to add one more thing to that list, community. Oh, yes. Connecting with other autistic people. That can be so powerful. It can. Finding your tribe, finding the people who really get and it. And understand what you're going through. It can be a lifeline, mm. whether it's online or in person. Yeah. It offers a sense of belonging, shared understanding, and mutual support. It's so important to feel seen and understood. It is. Especially when you've been dealing with something as isolating as abuse. Yeah. So we've covered a lot of ground in this deep dive. We have. But I want to circle back to something we talked about earlier, yeah. which is those societal perceptions of autism. Right. Because it feels like until we address that underlying stigma, mm -hmm. those misconceptions, autistic people are going to continue to be vulnerable. You're absolutely right. As long as we live in a world that stigmatizes and misunderstands autism, these issues will persist. So what can we do? We have to challenge those stereotypes. Yeah. Promote accurate information. Mm -hmm. Create more platforms for autistic people to share their own stories. And listen to them. Yes. Really listen to what they're saying. To their needs, their experiences, their hopes, their dreams. And believe them. Yes. Believe them. When an autistic person tells you that they're being hurt or manipulated, Believe them. Don't dismiss their experience. Don't try to explain away their feelings. Believe them and then let's work together to build a world where autistic people are not just tolerated but celebrated. Yes. For their unique strengths and contributions. I love that. A world where everyone can live authentically and thrive. It's a beautiful vision. Yeah. And on that hopeful note, mm -hmm. I think it's time to wrap up this deep dive. But before we go, I want to leave our listeners with one final thought. Right. We've talked about the impact of reactive abuse on individuals. Yeah. But what about its effects on the autistic community as a whole? That's a big one. How does this kind of abuse perpetuate stigma mm -hmm. and create barriers for autistic people who are trying to seek support and resources? That is a profound question. It is. And I encourage everyone to really consider that how can we cultivate a culture of support and understanding mm -hmm. that empowers autistic individuals to recognize and resist abuse? 
It's something I'll definitely be thinking about. You too. And I hope our listeners will join us in that reflection. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive. Thanks, everyone. We'll be back with more explorations soon.